Today we're going to be looking at another heavily requested XKCD what if video. Specifically, what if the Earth suddenly stopped spinning? Well, the Earth, well, considering the Earth spins at about 1600 kilometers per hour at the equator, things are going to go flying. And as heavily fortified as nuclear power plants are, they're not going to make it. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering operations to emergency response. I don't think know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's check this out. This is a question from Andrew, who asks, What would happen if the Earth and all terrestrial objects suddenly stopped spinning, but the atmosphere retained its velocity? Okay, the at so we're not losing the atmosphere. So if you're keeping the atmosphere, well, you're going to have a bunch of violent storms <laughs> and a bunch of the particulate matter that's flying at supersonic speed is going to be entangled in said atmosphere. Take a robust atmosphere to somehow maintain it. We're entirely in the realm of magic at this point, so why not? <laughs> well, first nearly everyone would die. Then things would get interesting. <laughs> at the equator, the Earth's... <laughs> cool geophysics. Gotta love it. The surface is moving at about 470 meters per second, a little over a thousand miles an hour, relative to its axis. If the Earth stops and the air doesn't, the air there will suddenly be moving over the surface at 470 meters per second. So to give you a sense of scale, this is over seven times faster wind than the strongest hurricanes. So I know there are certain buildings and even fortified structures such as nuclear power plants, their containment domes that are designed to be able to withstand sustained category five winds. But there we're talking like 150 miles per hour, 155 miles per hour. So don't think they can stand up to this very well. Especially considering suddenly stop, there's like, there's gonna be a massive acceleration at this. It would be one thing if it was a gradual stop, but considering the massive deceleration at work here from these, this relative velocity, it's, it's gonna be crazy. For reference, supersonic speed is 343 meters per second. The wind would be highest at the equator, mm -hmm. but everyone and everything living between 42 degrees north and 42 degrees south, which includes about 85% of the world's population, would also experience sudden supersonic winds. The high winds would only last for a few minutes near the surface before friction with the ground slowed them down. However, those few minutes would be long enough to reduce virtually all human structures to ruins. Yep, <laughs> this is just, Way too fast, way, way too much. It would be interesting if it was more of a gradual deceleration, then I suppose it would be the long, painful destruction of the seas migrating to the poles and the atmosphere migrating to, though I guess in this case the atmosphere is staying the same, so forget that last part. Here, nah, too quick. Even structures strong enough to survive the winds themselves would be in trouble. As comedian Ron White said about hurricanes, it's not that the wind is blowing, it's what the wind is blowing. Say you're in a massive bunker made out of some material which can withstand 1,000 mile per hour winds. That's good and you'd be fine. Good luck finding one that's strong. I mean, the only way would be as if it was, it would have to be underground, significantly underground at that point if you were the only one with a bunker. Unfortunately, you probably have neighbors, and if the neighbor upwind of you has a less well-anchored bunker, your bunker will have to withstand a supersonic impact by their bunker. And that's what's going to get you in, say, a hurricane, a tornado. It's more of the stuff that it's going to hit you with that will get you. It's not a matter of that you see in movies, uh, as long as you don't touch the funnel cloud, you're fine. No, you're likely to get hit by something else. And at that speed, the something else doesn't have to be very big to um, cause severe damage. My home in Boston is far enough north to be just barely outside the supersonic <laughs> wind zone, but the winds here would still be twice as strong as those in the most powerful real world tornado. <laughs> no longer supersonic awe, so just gonna be extremely heavy wind, no shock wave. Though 330 is pretty close. Temperature and height variations could have some effects. Those buildings would still be smashed flat, torn from their foundations, <laughs> and sent tumbling across the landscape. Winds would be lower near the poles, but no human cities are far enough from the equator to escape devastation. The highest latitude city on the planet is on the island of Svalbard in Norway, and even it would experience winds equal to those in the planet's current strongest tropical cyclones. Even so, the human race wouldn't go extinct. True, very few people above the surface would survive. Not, not immediately, anyways, um, but let's see if he talks about the the long-term effects. The flying debris would pulverize almost everything. However, a lot of people below the surface of the ground would survive the initial event just fine. The initial event, There okay. would be other lucky survivors, like the scientists and staff at the Amundsen-Scott Research Station at the South Pole. The surface of the Earth at the South Pole isn't moving relative to the Earth's axis because it's on the axis. People there would simply lose contact with the outside world. 
they'd probably be confused until someone noticed that the sun had stopped moving across the sky. The one thing I'm curious about is at the poles. So you're having a lot more wind and we're, and we're keeping the atmosphere. So the wind could bring in some, some warmer currents to create some intense storms. Now, I do completely agree with what he's saying about whatever extreme wind conditions and storm conditions are going to be less so at the poles than anywhere away from the poles, but I don't think the poles would be completely unaffected even, even within a few seconds to minutes. Then they'd be really confused. Back at the equator, things would get really weird. Wind sweeping over the oceans would have been churning up and atomizing the surface layer of the water. For a while, the ocean would cease to have a surface at all. It would be impossible to tell where the spray ended and the sea began. As the energy of the blasting wind... Yeah, because you got the, all the, these shockwaves, these supersonic effects. I didn't even think about that. That's just cool. ...began to dissipate, it would mostly go into heat. A lot of heat. But oceans are cold. Below the thin surface layer, they're a fairly uniform 4 degrees Celsius. The wind-blown spray would be heated by contact with the hot air and carried up into the layers of air still blowing above, making room for more cold spray, which would be heated and rise, and so on. The subsequent turbulent mixing would likely trigger worldwide thunderstorms over the oceans. Okay. The wind would also have momentum, which would transfer into waves which would sweep around the globe, west to east, and every west-facing shore would encounter the largest storm surge in world history. It would be like a combination of normal wind-driven waves and a tsunami. Okay, yeah, that's... So whatever city isn't already destroyed, somehow, I'm pretty sure everything would be. But even, I guess, some of the, some of the areas further towards the poles would still be affected by, by this water. A turbulent wall of water would flow ashore, reaching in some places many miles inland. Eventually, a dense blanket of fog would settle over the cold ocean surfaces. Normally, this would cause global temperatures to plummet. And they would, at least on one side of the Earth. If the Earth stopped spinning completely, the normal cycles of day and night would end. Okay, yeah, now we're getting into the long-term, tidally locked events. The sun wouldn't completely stop moving across the sky, but it would slow down a lot. As the Earth's orbit carried us in a circle, we would see the sun rise and set exactly once a year. Well, not exactly once a year. The momentum of the atmospheric winds would get transferred back to the Earth, starting it spinning again very slowly, since the atmosphere is much lighter than the Earth. Okay. Relative to the distant stars, a single spin of the Earth would now take around 3,000 years to complete. Wow. So I guess this is slightly different from being tidally locked, but I guess it's the if the atmosphere somehow kept going again due to magic, the atmosphere could actually spin the Earth, which is crazy considering how light the atmosphere is relative to the Earth. But that's actually really impressive. I mean, yeah, 3,000 years is a long time, but the fact that there's still enough to cause it to spin, I didn't, I didn't realize that. I figured it would be tidally locked at this point. So for all practical purposes, the once-per-orbit day that lasts a year would win out. Earth would experience six months of daylight and six months of night. On the day side, the surface would bake under the constant sunlight, mm -hmm. while on the night side, the temperature would plummet. Although Boiling oceans and freezing oceans. The length of the day would change, the length of the month would not. The moon hasn't stopped revolving around the Earth. In fact, the moon, our faithful companion, would act to partly undo what Andrew has done. Remember, this is all Andrew's fault. Before Andrew, the Earth's tidal bulge created by the moon's gravity slowed down our rotation while dragging the moon into a higher orbit. After Andrew stopped the Earth's rotation, the moon's gravity would tug on the Earth and very, very, very gradually speed us up again just a little while it slowed down. Until eventually, someone could again ask, what if the Earth suddenly stopped rotating? So one other thing that he didn't mention as much in is this is going to cause all kinds of seismic activity with ma massive earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, just from that momentum from the Earth suddenly going to a halt. I mean, all of that, all of that energy has got to go somewhere when you pump the brakes like that. The Earth doesn't magically transform that energy into something else, so you're going to see it in a bunch of nasty seismic activity, including earthquakes, volcanoes, and there'd be regular tsunamis generated from those things. This might even be one of those scenarios that you'd get magnitudes over 10 just from pumping the brakes that hard. If you want to hear more about earthquakes, I'll pin a comment down to the video I reacted to about what would happen if a magnitude 15 earthquake hit Earth, and then you'd get the effects like the oceans moving to the poles. So you would even have a supercontinent going around going down the equator, which might even be one of the better spots to try to live on if you're trying to live right on the line between day and night to mitigate the effects of the 
freezing and boiling water temperatures on the rest of Earth. It'd be a, the biosphere would be reduced to a very tight zone and it would be challenged by severe weather. So I don't think people are going to survive for much longer. The, the handful of survivors that are still there after a few months. Though I guess this scenario is slightly easier if you're keeping the atmosphere there in the sense that the atmosphere is still rotating. All the oxygen didn't move to the poles, so the people could at least breathe in this case, but I don't think people are lasting much longer. What do you think? Thank you, Moon. <laughs> this was a good one. Thanks again so much for the recommendation, and thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.